Good Benjamin morning. Patterson, this is amazing. We're here like this is great. The first time I met you was um, when you came to when you came to Columbia in um, two, no. it was 2010 or maybe 10, yeah. yeah 2010 no. 2011, and that was in the wake of uh, Valerie Cassell Oliver's show at the Contemporary Art Museum Houston. Right. I, you got it. Which I wrote a catalog. You wrote a for very. Her. Very, very nice piece for the catalog. Well, I'm glad you like it, because you ain't yeah. seen nothing yet. There's a new one coming out, <laughs> <laughs> University of Michigan Press, and it's, the title oh, of that cool. one is Ben Patterson's Spiritual Ex Benjamin Patterson's Spiritual Exercises. Uh -huh. And we can get around to why it's titled that in a minute. It relates to your, your early methods of processes, text oh, yeah. scores, and all that. Yeah. And maybe there's something in there. I mean, in a way, well, here's what I wrote. Here's the funny part. Um, there's a whole, th you know, one of my favorite pieces in there is the bakery piece. Okay. You know, enter bakery, smell. smell. Well, you yeah. know it, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can read it. Well, you can't really. It's hard to get that book. Actually, right? you have it. You know what? If uh, I'm messing up your screen now, but I uh, have a few extra copies that I just popped one in. This is. Uh, Japanese English version. This is it. <laughs> oh my goodness! Wow. And uh, got a little grass here, yeah, and just then decided that uh, they would uh, do this, but they made it pocketbook size because they thought people would like to carry it around with them and do it from time to time on the subway or walking it. That's why it's. Uh, so you can actually do, you can, this is, can, it can be like a, a manual. Can I open it? You yeah, yeah. Because I, I want to, oh, thank you, thank you. Because right, I want to um, see how this, what page is my favorite piece on? Oh, oh look, Japanese translation. Yes, that's what it's, it's oh, oh, here's, oh, this is the other one. Here's the other one. Think of number six, Bark Like Dog. Yeah. That's another big favorite of We mine. did that at, uh, oh, at the Lecture of Fine Arts. Uh, Institute on Monday was that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We kind of do it though. When I think of it, I think of it as you know, because you know, number six, right? I don't know. That's like you wrote this long before, but you, maybe you saw that show, The Prisoner. No. Well, it's by Patrick McGowan. He was he was his the his guy used to play the secret agent. The prisoner. He was stuck in this place. He had a number. It wasn't a name, and his number was number six. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> after this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, after it. Actually, Don Byron has a has a piece like this, but it's sort of like we're thinking of it like think of number six, bark like dog, think of number six twice, stand up. Do not think of number six and so on. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it, you know, but it's but that's not that's not it because these aren't read; they're performed. Yeah, performed. But this one is kind of performed silently, right? Uh, well, at the, uh, the Fine Arts Institute, I read the instructions, and then people did it. Uh, now the whole audience. So I said, "Think of number six, okay." Bark like dog, and everybody arf arf arf, stand up, stand up, sit down, and so forth. Yeah. So I do it as uh, sometimes mass uh, performance. Yeah. So people, well, yeah, because you stand up, you sit down, you bark like dog, and um, one thing in in this new essay, I didn't actually print this. But I was, it made me think about, did you have any interest in like cybernetics at this time? Uh, cybernetics came later, but yes. <laughs> what was it, what was, what was your interest in that? At this point? No, I mean now, and then later. later. Oh, well, just, uh, it's part of our world now. <laughs> it has to be, uh, uh, you have to live with it, uh, it's, uh, well, uh, I guess the mind and how it functions has always been of interest, and so it's uh, for me, I guess, um, how it functions as an extension of our mind and uh, perhaps it influences how we think uh, digitally yes, no, yes, no, and black, white. And, uh, 
Yeah, I'm not a, uh, an expert at all. But, uh, my first experience with computers was back with the New York Public Library in 1963, and uh, the computer was punch cards. <laughs> oh, yeah, I sort of remember that. Yeah, I, I sort of things. remember that. And uh, yes, you will appreciate this. I went off to Columbia to get my Master's of Library Science, and I uh, the master's thesis was how to computerize the card catalog of the New York Public Library. And they did it. <laughs> really? Yeah. So that's all I came about. Well, I, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. I have to, I'm going to have to uh, pick that one up. Yeah. Do, do you think there was any influence from the work you did as an artist on that particular work? You mean with the library? And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, well, something like this? I think they're probably two separate situations. You know, I, I would think that, but then I rethought it. Now, I'm looking for the bakery piece. I don't see it right away, but I have it here anyway. And it's very easy. It, it turns out to be very easy for a number of these pieces of methods and processes to represent them as computer flowcharts. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So they actually, and sometimes they have branching structures, like I think the one, a lawful dance for Ennis. I could show you yeah. this sometime. It's a pretty complicated branching structure, but you can represent them all. And that's why when I started doing them, and I did about four or five of them, uh, here, you know, like sometimes they're just very linear, like ring small bell, light candle, ring bell again, light candle, continue until. That's, no. a, that's a computer statement. Continue until Til there are no more candles, and yep. then you exit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it comes from my own... <laughs> well, there are a lot of them. It comes from my own work in computers, and so uh -huh. when I saw these things, I started looking at them. There was something there for me that... Uh, but I think the other point was that... Do, do you find that these scores serve kind of meditative or spiritual functions? Uh, meditative, certainly. Uh, uh, spiritual, I tend to. Uh, if you want to talk about it, it's okay. Yeah, they're not. Oh, they're not at all the same. First yeah, of all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but meditative, and uh, also just uh, the interest was, you know, making the viewer or whatever uh, the participant, the active party. Mm. Um, as it has always been my uh, thing that, you know, being a musician, performing, that uh, the audience gets about a third of the experience that you do as a performer. Mm. Uh, first, there's the kinetic thing, you know, the muscles of making your instrument, you know, getting your fingers going to where it should be. Uh, then, if it's an orchestra, you have one eye on the conductor and the other eye on the score, mm -hmm. and one ear on the sound you're making, the other ear on the sound that the rest of the ensemble is making and trying to, you know, make that mesh. And all of that, to me, made up the whole experience, and the audience sitting, you know, in their seats, and. Uh, the best they get out of that is watching the conductor dance around and they hear something, maybe they're tapping their feet, mm. but uh, it's not the same thing. So that was part of the methods and processes to uh, say action poetry in a sense. So. Mm. Well, there was the, there were these there were these things you did with Robert Filiou quite a long time ago. Yeah. Things where they were sort of mobile and you could do them anywhere. Yeah. And that seems to that seems to connect with the intended use of these on the Japanese subway. Yeah. So, yeah. And if, you know, it could go viral, right? You know, you see people doing it. <laughs> well, <laughs> places, you know, truck stops, you know, yeah. <laughs> and so on. But you know, here's what. 
it, it made me think about something. I've been working with a philosopher, Arnold Davidson, who uh, worked extensively with Pierre Hadot, the late philosopher, yeah. French philosopher. And he talks, he's written extensively on ancient philosophy and spiritual mm -hmm. exercises. And so here's what he says. He says, for me, I'm thinking that the scores do function as, when he says spiritual exercises, he's not talking about that kind of spirituality. He's talking about it more, but what he says is promoting a relationship to the self. Okay. You know, the yeah. cost, you know, to know oneself as a philosopher, someone okay. on the way toward wisdom. Yeah, okay. Uh, I could go with that, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, <clears throat> because uh, doing these things, you, uh, <clears throat> well, the bark like a dog, it depends uh, how confident you are, how, what kind of a, uh, if you're an out front person or not, how loudly you bark and so forth. And uh, it tells you something about yourself immediately, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, I could, I could live with that. Yeah. That's the thing. A lot of your pieces do tend to, if you're performing them, they do tell you, they they promote introspection. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's something that. How far back does that go with you? I mean, for example, when I was at the show in Houston, you did one. There was one installation where you had a lot of. Things hanging in a room. Oh, yes, what? that does. Uh, uh, the overall title is Blame It on Pittsburgh or Why I Became an Artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you're describing are uh, 18 plexiglass panels, about, uh, I guess, two, you know, about four feet by six feet or something, which is. <coughs> text and images uh, based on my biography from childhood on, mm. which was the result of uh, six weeks, five days a week uh, working with a psychoanalyst to find out in mm. Pittsburgh doing residency at the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts. And, uh, presumably looking for why among the various possibilities that I could have chosen as a career that it turned out to be an artist. Uh, was it in the you know, teens, I was very interested in uh, natural studies and herpetology, etymology, I was a volunteer at the zoo and at the museum and so forth. So actually up until about the senior year, it was this way, or this way, or this way, or this way, mm -hmm. and uh, finally went the other way. Well, arts. Um, I don't know if I came to any uh, final conclusions mm -hmm. about why, but uh, there's a lot of information there. Somebody else can decide why. You know. Well, I felt it clarified a lot of things for me uh -huh. personally because of being an artist and you know slightly younger generation, but also seeing the 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 issues you confronted, I think went well beyond you know with my career path, like some of the childhood incidents that you talked about, and some of the things that made me that reminded me of experiences that I had had coming up as an artist. Mm -hmm. And some of these experiences involved like race, for example, yeah. you know. And it was, it occurred to me when I, and that was something that maybe I wrote about, I've been writing about a relationship to your work, which I first heard about long before I, I met you. You were sort of this absent presence in my life. As they said, well, you know, you have to meet Ben Patterson. I said, well, how can I do that? And I said, well, you don't know where he is, you know. <laughs> but, um, I'm looking at this thing, you know, this radical presence, black performance in contemporary art. And, um, but when I was sort of doing the research on you, I didn't find that much in the standard kind of canonical sources for contemporary art. Even the ones, the ones, <coughs> or the ones that talked about African-American art, the mm -hmm. histories, the, yeah. the older ones, that 
I mean, you didn't seem to be there. Even when they talked about fluxes, I was pretty astonished. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, it, but, and that was totally at variance with everything I had heard about you from people who knew you mm -hmm. and also who, who were a part of fluxes, like Kosuti, you know, people I performed with later, or people who, or what I would read from, you know, the writings of Emmett Williams, or all, the, you know, everybody talks about you. The first person artist narratives, Benjamin Patterson, is, or Ben Patterson, is never absent. <laughs> but then when you get to the histories, suddenly it's a different path. I, yeah. I was just wondering, you know, it was particularly odd, you know, because Dominique René de Lerma actually notes it in his review of Eileen Southern's The Music of Black Americans, which every kid now reads in school. That's like a standard text, it's, you know, in college, everyone gets his book. But once again, he said, he said, he said, well, where is Benjamin Patterson in this book? You know, <laughs> this is a book about black composers. And so, why do you think that is? You, because in a certain sense, you maybe you became a little reclusive at a certain point. But, yeah. but maybe that's, that's not all, the whole of That's it. part of it. And then I think perhaps uh, when you talk about black composers, the work uh, really doesn't fit in the sense of music. So it's uh, so people have a difficult time finding where to place it, so uh, well, it's not notes for trumpet or uh, things like that, so that uh, makes it difficult to that, uh, from that perspective to find out uh, where, I uh, can't say that uh, composed chamber music or uh, symphonic music or uh, jazz or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's part of the problem. Uh, the other part, I guess, is as you say, I uh, quote, retired for a mm -hmm. period of time where I was uh, not terribly active with the New York Fluxus scene. Mm -hmm. And the there was, well, I had my problems with that scene as it developed over the period and became, uh, what, well, I'll just say, Fluxus weddings, Fluxus divorces, Fluxus funerals mm -hmm. didn't seem to be what I was interested in. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, uh, and there were a lot of uh, sort of little feuds for reasons that I didn't think was very interesting. And then uh, I you know, had other things to do to uh, want to earn money for the family and uh, then the sort of management career was interesting enough as it was and I thought uh, good things were happening there. Let me ask you a little bit more about this, because I kind of suspected that your, you know, your methods and processes sort of went outside of what a lot of the standard definitions and, and you know, the way people, look, I've had, like, people saying the word black composers, that's already an oxymoron in some circles. <laughs> and in other circles, it's, you know, it's like, a, it's like a symbol of, you know, bringing coals to Newcastle or something like yeah. that. <laughs> and, the sort of, and you can take that in terms of its color sense as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you look at that, um, but that's one way, that's one community's response to that that idea of the black composer. But then, the the part that interests me is when, because you didn't have a strong relationship with jazz, right? Uh, growing up, did you, it seemed like you up, talked about I'm, opera, you were, it, yeah, you know, it was interesting. Right? Uh, you know the Crawford Grill? No, no, I don't. In Pittsburgh, no. in the Hill District. Uh, I think I spent every Friday night I could after I was 16, could drive and so forth there. Yeah. Um, I remember um, 
Yeah, before I started uh, university, decided I wanted to see the country, so hitchhiked across and in San Francisco, the Black Hawk Bar, I think I extended my stay in San Francisco for five days just to hear Earl Garner every oh, night. Wow. All wow. All wow. All so, yeah, I, uh, in my head, was there, I loved it, and uh, so forth. Not a uh, performer, yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, no, and I think in the New York days, all of the jazz people I knew left, starting with Ornette and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and close friends. Uh, so it's, it's nothing absent from the life, and uh, uh, Probably it's more present in my performance because I uh, allow improvisation to be a major part of it. Yeah, yeah it's explicit in the scores yeah. that you talk about improvisation. And it seems that if you're going to perform this kind of work, you sort of have to be an improviser, but, right. but not in the sense that people normally take improvisation that is your your self-expressing or no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, bringing it from within uh, you're not doing that it's no, a different no. it, you know it's a different situation it's, uh, it's problem solving <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, but that's a lot of where i think you you're quite prescient in uh, cuz that's the way a lot of younger artists take Improvisation. Even if you look at someone like I had a, I had a conversation with Alvin Lucier about his piece, one well, of my favorite pieces of his, Vespers, which seems to be, be impossible to execute without improvisation. But there's this sort of prescription on improvisation. But you t it turns out not to be a direct prescription. You know, he's saying, well, any kind of process is not related to the the task of you know the problem solving of echolocation. You know, yeah, don't okay. do it. I mean, he's not really saying you can't improvise, but then he tells this story about how people in some conservatory started clicking on the sonar dolphins in this kind of, you know, yeah. this kind of very cliched way, you know, yeah. trying to create sound. And when he didn't, he just wanted you to, the sound would become a byproduct of oh, the activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I kind of see you doing. And um, it, interested, it interests me quite a bit that you are probably one of the few African-American musical artists who were doing sort of radical art of that kind who didn't have a performative connection with jazz, as far as I'm mm -hmm. aware. And that's, mm -hmm. and that's sort of very interesting for me. Uh -huh. you, know, you start to see that you see certain kinds of genre policing connected with race that you have to sort of, and so your your background, your history, I think, turned out to be a, a productive anomaly, you know, <laughs> an inspiring anomaly. You know? I mean, because people just, even if you wanted to sort of do something different, it was hard to do it because people just say, well. well but don't you, you're, people would tell you, like white people would say, well, you're ignoring your history. You say, what are you talking about? But you know, but it's but it's it's also interesting to me that art historians who may be part of the reason. I'm thinking about more of the art world now and not the music world. Mm -hmm. Part of, because I started to see that when I was reviewing the flux of histories, um, it was hard to get a sustained meditation or exegesis or con or engagement with your specific pieces and ideas and work. You know, they, you would be present, but it wasn't. People wouldn't like concentrate and say, "Well, here's what's going on here," and so. And so I thought that one of your strategies to counter that was the self-interview. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as I remember, 
the origins of that thing it was, I think, for the 40th anniversary of Fluxus, and there have been blah, 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 hundred days before, and mm -hmm. asked for this, uh, I sort of groaned and said, not another one. And, <laughs> uh, and David Doris, I think, was the editor, but, and he suggested, well, uh, why not, you don't like the questions, why don't you do your self-interview, and that's how it came about. And, because there were, you know, like the standard questions, blah, 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 everybody asked, and then a lot of questions that nobody ever asked. So that was uh, part of trying to get to those points. You know. mm -hmm. um, uh, there's, I guess, I didn't. Uh, engage myself so much with the doc, uh, doctrinary arguments that were happening in fluxes between Machunas and Henry Flint and so mm -hmm. forth at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, everybody uh, was rushing to get their sign up in front and so forth, and that didn't interest me so much as uh, do the work and it will. No, come through sooner or later, and we will have to justify it with uh, dogma. Yeah. People saw, yeah, is the extent to which people, you're saying people started to see, I could make my career from this. Yeah. But I was, was but that wasn't part of Bacchus's original aim in a way, with the magazine and all that. Yeah, well, that's uh, uh, his orientation purpose uh, changed uh, over the time you know, yeah. when he uh, in 62 in Germany and so forth the magazine was to be a magazine you know, and yeah. publishing other things but then uh, discovered he had this baby and he could be Andre Breton and, <laughs> da, 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 and then it went in a completely different direction and uh, no, then fluxes as a whatever institution, art direction uh, came about, but that wasn't his intention in the beginning. And, uh, as that uh, shift came about, this when it became less interesting for me. Yeah. But was it ever? What was the intention <coughs> of you guys to be an uh, organization with, like, you know? Uh, structure like that? And originally not, but mm -hmm. that was what Machinus tried to force on the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And you're a member, or you're not a member, or oh, you're excommunicated. Yeah, you excommunicated you. <laughs> <laughs> you're excommunicated. <laughs> All sorts of reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. Number one was uh, working with the competitors, so to speak. Uh, uh, you participate in the Charlotte Mormon avant-garde oh. festival, and that was the reason for excommunication. Or publishing with the something else press, Dick Higgins, that was the reason for excommunication. But I thought Dick was a, he was a fluxus guy. Well, he was, uh, <laughs> you know, they were all um, in the beginning fluxus people, but Dick was excommunicated when <laughs> he set up the something else press, because that was competition and actually uh, Dick uh, had uh, a few pieces that he wanted to have published and so forth, I guess post space mm -hmm. and the Machunas magazine, the Fluxus thing was going on and on and on and wasn't getting, uh, things weren't being published so to speak, it was delayed, delayed. So Dick said, well, I'll just start my own press and get it out there. And that was immediate uh, reason for excommunication. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, then there were the manifestos and you could say the rules of the game, what you could do and what you couldn't do. And then, as I say, it became the 
majority became Henri Breton, and a group was presumably formed. Uh, but uh, the what I always consider sort of quote the core flux is about forty people uh, mm -hmm. really fit within that thing. The uh, Machinists might have had them on a list, but. Uh, uh, and there were meetings, right, but so very few people came, you know. And even the manif there were maybe three manifestos which he kept writing, but nobody ever signed them either. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, in some ways, uh, when John Hendricks argues that George Machinus was Fluxus, he is correct because the uh, Fluxus as a organization, as an institution, was more in, I think, in George's head than in other people. I mean, we respected, liked each other's work, uh, grateful for the networking and so forth, but uh, that one has to subscribe to the notion that a piece can't be longer than 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, or some, yeah. some, some dogma or yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But when you do that, yeah. you know, the thing is about Tidal, from, from my standpoint, I guess I compared it with Fluxus near the end of this more recent essay with the Association for the Advancement Creative Musicians, which is a group that came out of Chicago, yeah, African American yeah. Collective, and which I was a part of and wrote a yeah. book about. But the thing is that you began to see, first of all, the same kinds of tensions that you describe about competition within the group and certain kinds of decollages in terms of getting stuff out, which which said, well, we got to move. We can't just stay here statically. And then there was this notion of radical democracy that some people became very uncomfortable with. And, all the kinds of competitions that turn up. And what I find, one has sentence, maybe one has to have a sense of compassion about that. I'm sorry? A has. sense of compassion about it. No. I'm for, so, co toward you, yourself, and the members of the group, and even Machunas and the others, because, you know, what I see are a lot of what I see are a lot of young artists feeling their way in uncharted territory. Yeah. Well, look at you guys. Yeah. That's what well, I that was what I meant, uh, very grateful for the networking thing. And you found uh, people doing work uh, similar or at least supportive or that was very interesting to you that may not have discovered outside of this uh, Machinus thing. Uh, I mean, like the. Uh, the Japanese were very important, I think, to the whole thing, and it was basically through George that they uh, uh, got to New York and so forth. I mean, they had sort of known that there was something out there, but specifically what it was was not clear. Well, so, um, yeah, so there was. Uh, mm, and earlier I used to describe it as a, a big cruise ship, <laughs> which everybody was on, we had a lot of fun. And then sometimes I talk about it as a, a circus in which there are many different kinds of talents. There's the tight rock work, tight rope walker, uh, the lion tamer, the, the clowns, and so forth. And, George in the middle is the thing <laughs> cracking the whip. You know? uh, so, uh, the, as I say, different kinds of talents, but they're all working within this big, under the same tent, you know, it says fluxes on the top, but uh, all from various different backgrounds and different training, but uh, you mix and match until it works together, it uh, sort of gels. And it comes out of the people, the people create and their activity somehow gets subsumed under fluxus and there's something, it's, it's amorphous but 
somehow there there is a sense of definition and direction. Yeah. yeah. Even across all these different people, you know, yeah. Allison Knowles or whoever, you know, all these people that I've met over the years and they all they all do very different work, but yeah. somehow it's somehow rather it gels. <laughs> yeah. That's it's a mystery. It's a it's a it's a wonderful mystery. I have a lot of questions I want to ask you, but I, I, I brought a couple more. Um, because, you know, one of the more, from my standpoint, uh, notorious pieces was the licking piece. <laughs> and, um, but I found it notorious for different reasons, because, you, you know, it's that simple score, which has been sort of taken in all kinds of directions. You know, people have taken it beyond the uh, cover shapely female with whipped cream to cover anybody with whipped cream. Yeah. You know, so it's become, but the thing is that it's become non-gender specific in that way. But, um, but the funny thing is that um, when you guys, at least the pictures, I think very few people have actually experienced the original piece, right? Yeah. So a lot of the reputation came out of the pictures. Yeah. And the pictures, I guess, show you and maybe Bob Watts, was it? Yeah. And, and uh, this, this uh, young woman who I later found out about because she published her own reminiscence of it. Bloody eyes, you know. Yeah, yeah. she published something about it. But the interesting thing about it was, for me, was you guys, were you guys in Soho or Greenwich Village, was it? It was in Soho, yeah. Loft on Canal Street, 319 or something, the Plexus Loft. Did it ever cross your mind that if you had done that in certain parts of the U.S., that the Knight Riders would have come for you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even at the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, it was very interesting because uh, you know, I had uh, written this in Paris just before the uh, Fluxus Festival and so forth, and uh, Beast Button somehow or other didn't uh, seem to be able to get close to finding somebody to do it. And then the next festival was in Copenhagen, and Copenhagen, Denmark, then was supposedly the wide open city for sex and so forth. And uh, Andy Kopke, a Danish Fluxus artist, uh, mm -hmm. thought that he had somebody lined up to do it. And uh, at the last minute, she backed out. And I remember him sitting there all afternoon going through his little black book, all the people. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, he even got to the professionals. And, oh, wow. <laughs> and they didn't even want to get near it. <laughs> so it was uh, hmm. rather uh, interesting that Bloody, who had been you know, working with Alan Capro and others, mm -hmm. decided to do it. But, uh, okay, talk about uh, uh, race and that period. I don't know what Letty has written in the reminiscence. Uh, I knew her quite well, but even then. And uh, I've only recently learned that she had always assumed that it was a piece of Bob Watts and that I was his assistant. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it could have been because Bob Watts convinced her to do it that she thought that that was what it was, but that was uh, always really curious. Um, oh. Yeah, uh, it's gone, as you say, uh, various directions as I began uh, making my Reader's Digest versions of Grand Opera, I call it only the best parts. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Carmen and Madame Butterfly and Blick Piece is now Tristan and Isolde. Oh really? Oh yes. I didn't know that, I didn't know that. Trajectory. And uh, for a long time with the live person but then I found in the museum shop some place or over a blow up to almost five feet tall of Munch's The Scream, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so now I get to pump her up during the prelude to Tristan and Isolde. 
and copper with whipped cream. And that's what we did in uh, uh, roulette this time. Oh, I yeah. oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, I prefer that to the live verse or the live woman. No, it's, uh, well, one of the things she said, Letty Eisenhower said, was that you, you guys, at the performance, you didn't seem super enthusiastic about doing it yourselves. Oh, and that you that you know it was like they did it, but without a lot of enthusiasm. I think is what she said, mm. and uh, so that was very interesting to me. But what's what, what interested me also was the reception of the piece has been largely in terms of gender, and there's been no talk. I mean, of race and that connection because if a lot of the early reception is based on an analysis of, you know, the, the pictures. Yeah. And the pictures clearly show a black man licking a white woman's, uh, you know, uh, body. And so this is one of the, and if you're thinking 1964, 64, right. and uh, this is like, you know, the civil rights movement <laughs> raging, and that's the year of the, the Birmingham church bombing and all yeah. this stuff. Uh, and Greenwich Village and Soho were no hot beds no of hot tolerance beds. either. <laughs> no, <not laughs> so I mean, Baraka talks about growing, you know, being Greenwich Village and you know, and you know, having yeah. a lot of problems, you know. So it looked so that's it's interesting to me because it could have been anybody doing it, but it just seems that because of the, I mean, you have pieces where you overtly confront race, like, you know, the educating white folks thing. Yeah, yeah. But this one seems to be one that where race and gender are active in equal measure, but not because of the score, but because of the circumstance of the performance, and yet the historians tend to focus on the gender aspect and yeah, the race part with race out. Yeah. And that, that interested me. You know. Yeah. Uh, Uh, I think, uh, well, uh, art historians like to think they're above it all, so it's easier to talk about the gender than the race thing, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, that was part of it, uh, that uh, would rather uh, make the case that race was not an issue, you know, that everything was fine, uh, whereas gender uh, uh, it's a little easier to talk about now. Maybe for this generation, I mean, maybe later, I mean, with people like that, who obviously Thelma Golden, or, or even with people who did both criticism and performance, like Adrian Piper, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Sort of changed. I mean, it, but you, you were you the only African American or African descent person in the fluxes? As, as far as I know, you know was, there were a few that had that one drop. <laughs> <laughs> like that guy the other day, right? That guy, they see he's a big white supremacist, and then they did his DNA and they found he had 15% from Sierra Leone or somewhere. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> that test is wrong. Suddenly we're on like the Maori show. They're saying, uh, you are the father. I said, no. <laughs> I am not the father. I don't care what your test says. <laughs> Well, I only have a few other things to, to question you, although we could go on for a long time, but you know, I don't want to yeah. keep you too long. Um, you know, I didn't want to, I wanted to ask you more about, well, I had two things I wanted to ask you about. I just wanted to say on the record that Variations for a Double Bass, which is kind of a breakout piece for you, yeah. going back that far. You know, it's something that turns up in classical music. And, you know, this was a kind of classical music. You have classical background as a, as a performer and composer, and um, also background in electronic music. But you don't see this kind of thing turning up in classical music for Today, another decade. Yeah. No, for oh, another decade. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is that true? It seems to me to be true. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I was Lachenmann is the closest analogy I can come up with. Mm. And he starts doing things around 1970, so uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know, taking the, preparing the instrument, working on these sounds, and also, 
you talked about the theatrical aspect as being important as yeah. well. It's, it, that was your breakout piece in terms of the conception of multimedia. Yeah. yeah. But it also looked like a breakout piece for classical music, which is sort of unacknowledged because of maybe because of the circles you were in, sort of being part part music, part performance. Yeah. But people feel. weren't doing that. I mean, yeah. you know, as far as I could tell, with the uh, I mean, John Cage yeah. was the only one, but after that. <clears throat> yeah, well, that was where the influence was coming from, or for me. Um, and I remember uh, very well <clears throat> performing cartridge music at the Baumeister, Mary Baumeister's studio in Cologne, mm -hmm. uh, and some other things. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's strange that it didn't uh, come into, quote, contemporary classic music sooner because they, uh, from electronic music, tape music, the sound already existed. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, to move that to uh, instruments was not that far away, but uh, no, I guess it didn't. But <clears throat> I would, uh, I was about to say it was there in jazz already, but actually didn't come until uh, not really a scholar, but I'm thinking uh, probably Ornette really began to open it up with the, you know, Blappy plap a sax and so forth. And, yeah, or and people that started that's... doing unusual things with yeah. instruments, yeah. Like, especially when he started playing the trumpet and the yeah. violin and, and, and these kinds of things. But in terms of re reconfiguring the instrument, yeah. you know, just sort of taking it apart or adding odd things. Because in jazz, there was always this anti-technological bent. You know? yeah. So yeah. someone like Eddie Harris, who I knew you know, pretty well from Chicago, yeah. Yeah. working with you know uh, Echo Plectas and all those kinds of things. And so I'd say that's early Afrofuturism for me. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, but you don't see his name up there. You, know? you see his son, Ra, which came rather late to, yeah. you know, yeah. ex to that kind of thing in comparison. Um, with the Moog and so on. By that time, you know, Eddie had gone on to something else. But um, it, you you said one other thing in a, in another interview, a more recent one, because um, you know there's that Ben Patterson tells flux of stories, oh. and there's a long interview with um, with you. I think on that is that the recording or one of the others. It's a long mm -hmm. interview, and. Um, you were talking about people wanting to, you, it was something you wanted to make, you guys wanted to make a kind of art that you could take away. Oh, yeah, that was, uh, quote, anti-commercialism, in other words. Yeah, uh, it's like you say, you can only buy and sell yeah. something which has material, physical presence. Yeah, yeah. And this was, uh, to create an immaterial thing which couldn't be bought and sold and traded. Um, yeah, that uh, you know, fits into methods and processes, you could say, from that point forward. Uh, but or, that's kind of changed a little bit, right? I mean, you do make that. There are a yeah, lot of no. objects in this show. <laughs> it was a great, fantastic show. <laughs> well, um, that's, in, that's part of the issue, right? I mean, yeah, how does one manage to, uh, maybe it's not principles, but how do you compose um, um, uh, artistic practice without those kind of arbitrary... Yeah, uh, it's a... Uh, you know, yeah, it's an interesting question and problem because, uh, you know, at least I do get interested uh, in what happens with material things when you do this and that with them. It's another uh, form of, uh, you can't express that, put that out without using those things. Mm. So. Uh, 
Uh, the you know, the big problem I think then and even still now is how to use uh, work in that media without it, uh, the commercialism and the pricing taking over uh, the thing so that you start, oh, they'll like it better if there's more red. <laughs> you can jack up the price another uh, without that getting in the way. Uh, and that, uh, it's a bit hard in this world to do. Um, example, next year comes the big 80 and I was wow. planning on making a kind of 10 city tour in Europe as a sort of, so I said, walk down memory trail to say thanks for support. And, the old days when I really needed it and so forth. And uh, because the schedule was uh, tight, I thought maybe this time I'll get somebody to help in the background and so forth. So, uh, interesting person who's been around, the director of this now. But it's hard to keep them down without. Uh, you know, well, it has to be a major museum here, and it has to be that. I said, that's not what I want to do. You know, I want mm. to talk to my friends and enjoy uh, that company. It's not, I'm not promoting my career, and I don't, it's over. It's a thank you for, you know, being there. And so it's, uh, what can you say, the whole market and so forth is such that it, tries to push you into a situation that you may or may not want to be in. And mm -hmm. uh, so it becomes a problem of how to use uh, that media without prostituting yourself, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. you know, um, but a lot of that work you know, there's the was there's the cultural historian of German Andreas Hewson who wrote an article on Fluxus, kind of a influential. I'm sorry, he, Andreas Hewson. He teaches at Columbia. Mm, he wrote a book called. He, he's, he, you know, if you follow that kind of thing, he's yeah. you know, sort of a big guy. So anyway, but he he wrote a very interesting article on Fluxus, which he called it an avant-garde born out of the spirit of music. Uh huh. Yeah. And so. I'd be, I'd be interested to know, I mean, when you make these objects, are they so far, they're, I mean, you're not making sound sculpture, for the most part. I mean, no, not but, in that sense, no. no. But do, is there a, a sonic presence or influence? Uh, or, I would or say or that... Spiritual so. spirit? Uh, um, I think generally aware of uh, a structural um, uh, musical structure behind the work uh, mm. that uh, is, I won't say all but some as a sort of linear character as in music and where it's a beginning and an end uh, Texts often play a role in that, which gives you a starting point and an end point and so forth, uh, as opposed to just scattered letters here and there. Yeah. Uh, a sort of major piece in the last couple of years, something called uh, About Fairy Tales, actually, in the title. Fairy tales, all you need to know from once upon a time until happily ever after. <laughs> and the, the morphology of the, the principal uh, characters in fairy tales that turn up all the time. It's uh, uh, the damsel in distress and the handsome hero and the evil stepmother and blah, blah, blah. Fairy godmother. Uh, and so it has that. Uh, uh, linear definition to it, uh, which, no, is 
like music because it takes place and time. There's a beginning and an ending. You know? uh, even if you're talking about white noise, <laughs> it's, music it starts and stops someplace or other. Um, well, you said a funny thing. <coughs> this is, this is, I think this is from your self-interview. It's a discussion with Daniel Spurry. Yeah. It's, I think it's, I've translated this, so it might not be exactly correct. It says, Ben, we were lucky. I started as a classical oh, yes. ballet dancer, you as a classical musician. Yeah. Yeah. Both of us learned the discipline of art elsewhere, and now since we both changed our medium, we're free to create without dragging around the historical ballast from our first art form. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember that, well, all that conversation, and I think that's correct because uh, one uh, ballet as much as classical music, odds of you have to be disciplined to uh, be you know proficient on the top and so forth, and uh, then once you get out of there, this uh, okay. Call it order, if you will. Uh, uh, it's with you forever. Yeah. And then you can pick up anything, you know, a piece of dirt, <laughs> but <laughs> you make it uh, structured in a way that, uh, at least in your mind, it's uh, in a particular order. It, there's a reason why it's there and not there. You know. mm. I only have one more thing I want to ask you because everybody's got to do it. I have one more thing. Just, ask you, just let me ask you one more thing. Um, because you said that you got, you're going to be 80 next year. Yeah. And you're doing a kind of a tour. Right. Now, you know, I mean, you thanks for whatever, but in fact, you're making work all the time. I mean, it's not like this is the, I don't see this as being the last tour. I don't really know. Oh, no. So what kinds of things are you planning for this future? What, do you, what new work are you doing oh, or have well, been doing over um, the past few years? Actually, <laughs> what's going to happen on this tour, I was thinking, as I was developing the idea, well, at least 10 places will... I've been doing a series of uh, what I call nanofluxes, in other words, performances in miniature on a tabletop, but then live camera, so you have it in the back. And, uh, take some of those things around and different things, and suddenly I thought, you know, this is a medicine show, oh, a medicine <laughs> show, that's what it is. And uh, I can't remember the sequence of how things happened, but in any case, it's now uh, Dr. Ben, uh, <laughs> well, um, uh, okay, if you know, you're an art lover or whatever, but you're having problems understanding and appreciating contemporary art, Dr. Bend will do a brain scan on you <laughs> and identify those areas of the brain where you have blockage or uh, faulty connections and to them describe uh, one of the fluxes snake oil in the series as a cure. <laughs> and of course, you know, these snake oil elixirs in the old days, the reason they worked, they were about 40% alcohol and 10% opium. So <laughs> <laughs>